We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. Hello and welcome to Tractor Time. Tractor Time is brought to you by Acres USA, the voice of eco agriculture. I'm your host, Ben Trollinger, editor of Acres USA magazine. Today we're presenting a double feature on farm activism. I was lucky enough to catch up with Sherry Duggar and Judith McGarry at the Acres Eco Ag Conference in Minneapolis back in December. Both of them were speakers at the multi day event, which pulls in leaders in sustainable farming from all over North America and beyond. Sherry and Judith really are at the forefront of efforts to empower small farmers and to fight for better food policy. And I'm thrilled to present these conversations to you on this episode of Tractor Time. But before we get to that, a word from our sponsor. You are listening to the Tractor Time Podcast. We are proud to be sponsored by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers and homesteaders. BCS is often mistaken for just a rototiller, but with gear-driven transmissions and dozens of professional quality implements, they truly make superior pieces of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS two-wheel tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. With PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, chippers and shredders, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a high-pressure irrigation pump, BCS America can supply tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and the homestead. Even on large farms where a four-wheel tractor is a necessity, BCS two-wheel tractors will tackle jobs that simply can't be done with larger machines, from mowing steep slopes and along pond banks to working soil and high tunnels and hoop houses. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments and watch videos of BCS in action. Hey, it's Ben. First up is a brief conversation with Sherry Duggar, who was fresh off a trip to Washington, D.C. It was there that Sherry and a group of farmers and ranchers voiced their support for the Green New Deal. Sherry worked for years as a journalist, and she's just as surprised as anyone that she's evolved into a leading activist for farmers and ranchers. Just recently, she was named as the executive director of the Socially Responsible Agriculture Project, Before that, she was executive director of the Women, Food, and Agriculture Network. She's the co-chair of the National Farmers and Ranchers for a Green New Deal Coalition, which we will talk about right now. Hello, this is Ben Trollinger, editor of Acres USA Magazine. I'm here with Sherry Duggar. She's the executive director of the Women, Food, and Agriculture Network and the Indiana Farmers Union. She's a consultant for the American Grass-Fed Association. She's also a co-chair of the National Farmers and Ranchers for a Green New Deal Coalition. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Appreciate it. So that last piece, uh, Farmers and Ranchers for a Green New Deal Coalition, that has a story behind it. Um, You recently, you, along with a coalition of farmers, ranchers, and activists, sort of marched on Washington in support of a Green New Deal. Talk a little bit about how that came to be and how you got to be involved in that. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. Um, Regeneration International and Organic Consumers Association contacted me and asked me if I would be interested in being a co-chair along with um, Ben Dobson, who's uh, in upstate New York, I think, as well as Will Harris from White Oak Pastures in Georgia. We're all co-chairs of this coalition that represents more than 10,000 farmers and ranchers and advocates across the nation who are in support of the Green New Deal. So um, September, I think it was around September 19th, 17th, something like that, um, we all went to D.C., flew in, and had a press conference there on Capitol Hill to talk about um, why we felt the Green New Deal was a good starting point for conversation around climate change and agriculture being a solution to the problems of climate change. And so I think a lot of people might have been surprised that farmers and ranchers were coming out in support of something that is maligned on Fox News. And I think there's sort of a cliche out there that farmers and ranchers are, you know, conservative people who Mm -hmm. vote along a party line. But when it comes to climate change, they're on the front lines. I think they know what's at stake um, and they know what's what needs to be done. What was your experience um, in being part of the, the formation of this coalition? 
So I think that there's still a divide out there in terms of whether farmers and ranchers want to use the word climate change. There's a lot of people who don't want to talk about human-caused climate change. They don't believe in it necessarily. Um, that's all a matter of language and, and um, you know, our lexicon, whatever we choose to use as to describe the events that are happening out there, farmers and ranchers are still on the front lines being affected and impacted by it, by the weather every day. So we can talk about weather in very general terms, but what we are doing is we see an opportunity, why we choose to support the Green New Deal and, and to talk about it as a, a, you know, a viable option for conversation moving forward is simply that, because farmers and ranchers need to be involved in that conversation. This is an opportunity to say agriculture indeed has an impact on our environment, a negative one in some ways, a positive one as well. And so how do we be a solution? How do we act you know, in, in positive support of our, of our weather patterns and then our environment? And how can we actually impact climate change and, and resolve the problems that we see ahead? And when did this start becoming an issue for you personally? What, what got your attention? So my personal involvement is really from the standpoint of all the work that I do as an advocate, as an executive director, having my own small farm, bringing people to our property to talk about, you know, the issues. Um, when, I, when my husband and I uh, moved out to our farm back in 2012 and started building it out, it was really a matter of understanding that we needed to take care of the land we wanted to take care of animals. We wanted to feed ourselves well. We wanted to feed our community and really have a conversation with our community to build a community around agriculture again, which we didn't really see out in rural areas so much, at least not in a very socialized, you know, uh, tight-knit kind of a way. And in doing so, it was a very simple idea in the beginning of just do these things well. And it, my husband and I both got really involved with National Farmers Union, with Indiana Farmers Union, and started learning about the issues and what was going on. And then it became a much larger presence in our life and really a calling, I would say, to, to fight on behalf of rural communities, to fight on behalf of independent family farmers, to fight on behalf of animals, wildlife, biodiversity, environment, you know, and public health, essentially, because mm -hmm. all of that impacts our public health. And what's your background in, in farming? Um, not very much, actually. I didn't grow up in agriculture. I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. I moved to New York City right after college. I was a journalist for 20 years. I was um, editing a publication called Farm Indiana for five years, um, along with several other publications. And in that process, I sort of refer to that as my unofficial college education for agriculture because I started learning these issues then and really figuring out, like, what the food system looked like, what we were supporting with our purchasing, you know, whenever we'd go to the grocery store, and really started understanding that there was impact, you know, from our dollars. And, and um, at that point, it really transitioned me out of journalism into this other world of working for Indiana Farmers Union, first as a media and outreach coordinator, eventually running the organization as executive director, and then moving on and doing a lot of consulting work for other organizations. I want to go back to what you were saying about that day in Washington. I, I kind of want to, I was wondering if you could describe it a little bit for us. What was it like? Did you feel like it made an impact? <laughs> what kind of conversations were you having? Um, it's one of those moments where you realize, how did I get here? You know, I've had a lot of those moments. I've been sitting in rooms in quiet, closed meetings with USDA officials, you know, second up to Purdue or, you know, next up to Purdue and Trump and, and those types of things or being in stories, quoted in stories where I'm like, how did this happen? I was on the, your side of things. I was in journalism just simply reporting what was going on in the world and learning about those issues, you know, from that aspect. And, and now all of a sudden I'm on the opposite side where I'm opinionated and I have, you know, thoughts and opinions about these things. And I'm not just an, an unbiased, you know, reporting editor or reporter um, telling a story, but really just like trying to impact and create change uh, out there in this world. And it's one of those moments when you're standing on Capitol Hill and there's several, you know, uh, senators and, and representatives standing with you talking and Cong uh, Congressman Blumenauer recognized me from a time that we had spoken a year prior. He mm -hmm. actually quoted me on what I had said a year prior, which mm -hmm. blew my mind because uh, he said, you know, told me what I said told me what my name was, told me what state I was from, and then he was like, it's important. You know, this agriculture stuff is important, and that's why he remembered it. So those, those are life-changing moments of just like, this is, we are important. We have a voice. Mm -hmm. We need to use our voice, and we need to be heard and be seen talking about these issues. Um, and he was just a, a real, to me, 
him telling me what I said a year prior made me realize how important these stories are. Those congressmen, those senators, they hear these stories every day about so many different issues mm -hmm. in D.C. And for him to remember that and to keep that you know, knowledge with him moving forward is really important and shows it speaks to how much we need to be involved. Now, when I think the average person thinks about the Green New Deal, they see this sprawling mm -hmm. sort of large structural sort of change that means that they're, someone's going to take away their hamburgers and they're going to have to drive a lame electric car or something like that. <laughs> they, they have, everyone has their own idea of what that means. It's such a big idea. And, you know, frankly, it's a response to a very big problem. Mm -hmm. But what do you want farmers to know about the Green New Deal specifically? Why is it to their benefit? Well, we have a saying in Farmers Union, and it's if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. And that's kind of how we feel if we're not at the table talking about these issues and making sure that our opinions and our voices are heard and our experiences and our truths are conveyed to the people that need to know, then this is not going to benefit us. And so far, policy in our country does not benefit the independent family farmer. It doesn't in benefit the rural communities that are dying because of what's going on in our agriculture system. It doesn't benefit our health. It doesn't benefit future generations. So everything that I do, I don't feel like it's doing anything for me necessarily that will change in my lifetime, but it's for future generations. And I feel like consumers, you know, eaters, farmers, food producers, everyone needs to make sure that they are, they are being heard on these issues. You know, I, the Green New Deal, um, with good reason, has been associated with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And maybe for some people, she might be easy to, to dismiss. Mm -hmm. But for Americans who maybe vote Republican, maybe watch Fox News, um, I kind of get the feeling that farmers aren't as easy to dismiss. Um, exactly, yeah. They I have a certain that. authority. I would agree with that. I think that farmers are important, their voice is important, and people do respect them. But I, I think it's easy to, and somebody asked me actually this at the press conference, you know, about those jokes, about the cow farts and those types of things. That's the easy way to just shove this away, to shove this problem off the, you know, off the table and say it's no big deal, it's a joke, it's funny. But that's, that doesn't change the reality of what our world is today and what our farmers face every day. So their experiences, like I said, their truths matter and they're they're living them and if they're not out there talking about them then they're going to have a big problem when it comes to policy that doesn't support them well green new deal aside if you had your druthers what do we need to do to fix the food system <laughs> if i knew that i would be <laughs> in a much you different probably position. have a few ideas <laughs> um I, I i think that we have to work on every level we have to work on individuals, com consumers. We have to talk to farmers about what they're doing and, and how they can be a part of that solution. We have to talk to their families, their friends, the consumers who are purchasing from them. We have to talk to organizations and make sure that our organizations are working together. We have to build infrastructure in our communities to have new, different food systems that actually work for local food systems that feed communities rather than talking about feeding the world. And then we have to talk about changing policy on a federal, state, and local level. So there's work throughout this food system on every level that we have to deal with. Where do you see the most hope right now? Where, where do I see the most hope? In conventions like the one that we're at right now, uh, the Acres Convention, I, I think that's where we lose a lot of our fights when we go to D.C. and talk to legislators. We lose a lot of our fights when we talk to you know, legislators on a state level want to go and ask for common sense, you know, concentrated animal feeding operation reform, and we lose because there's big money involved and there's big players involved. And so those are really kind of the disappointing days. But then on the other hand, when I come to events like this and I see so many people interested and knowledgeable and doing good work, it's that that's where the hope comes from and that's what re-energizes me. Yeah. So. Well, thanks so much for talking with Thank us today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, next up is Judith McGarry. She's an attorney, an activist, she's a farmer in small town Texas, and she's founder and executive director of the Farm and Ranch Freedom Alliance. She's a passionate advocate for building durable local food systems and a fierce critic of government policies that don't serve small farmers. She's a force of nature who uses her expertise in law to empower her fellow farmers and to set lawmakers straight. FARFA, her group, is an organization you should definitely check out. I'll provide a link to their website in the show notes. And without further ado, here's my interview with Judith McGarry, captured live at the EcoAg conference in December. So I'm here with uh, Judith McGarry, um, executive director of 
the Farm and Ranch Freedom Alliance, and she's here with us at the EcoAg Conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we're pleased to have her with us. Um, Judith, tell me a little bit about the work that your alliance is doing uh, for small farmers. So we're advocates for small-scale sustainable farmers and ranchers and local food producers. So the basic concept is that the laws and regulations we have have been written by and for the big agribusiness companies. Um, and frankly, they work pretty well for those big companies. They don't work well for small businesses, and they don't work well for sustainable and regenerative producers. So what FARFA was created to do, and what we've been doing for coming up on 14 years now, is act as a voice to try to get those laws and regulations changed, to protect small farmers from new laws and regulations that are damaging to them, and to try to move the whole system framework to something that will work for the regenerative agriculture movement. Can you give me an example or maybe a few examples of how sort of these broad regulations hurt small farmers, maybe a few things that stick out in your mind as being particularly onerous? So I'll start with um, the two, two of the biggest issues that we worked on early on, the first being mandatory electronic ID for livestock. The, back then it was called the National Animal ID System. And this was a plan that the big agribusinesses had come up with mm -hmm. to require every single animal to be electronically tagged and tracked. And it's a system that works great for the large scale because what they want is this mass tracing system to improve the export and import markets. And it's pretty cheap when you put out the cost over tens of thousands of head. Um, they even had a system where if they were vertically integrated, so the animals were owned by the same company, they didn't have to do the tagging. They could just basically make it a paper system. But you take that and you put it on a pasture-based producer who has to literally go out there, tag their animals. They probably don't have, you know, they might have 20 head, they might have 50 head. The costs of the infrastructure are just really um, incredibly burdensome. And the paperwork burdens, they were including reporting movements, recording, you know, every purchase, every sale, every trip to a vet, every, you know, everything. It doesn't make sense. And it provided no benefit for the small-scale producers. Our producers who are selling direct to consumers or who are selling to local markets where there's uh, transparency, they, have, they, they keep the name on their product all the way through, we don't need electronic tax. Mm -hmm. Our produce, our customers know where food's coming from. So there was that. And that was what we were founded to stop. And we fought back and, and pushed back and kept the program from happening. Um, we also worked on the Food Safety Modernization Act in Congress, which was a complete overhaul of the regulations by FDA. Now, we need better regulations of our food safety system. I mean, right now, what are we on yet another romaine lettuce outbreak? I mean, right. every, every winter is I've just, stop eating romaine. I've just romaine. scratched romaine out of my diet completely. <laughs> if I can't find it at the farmer's market, I don't eat romaine lettuce anymore. Right, right. So there's a, we need better food safety racks. There's a real problem out there. People shouldn't have to worry about dying from eating salad. Um, there's such an irony to this and it's romaine lettuce. But at the same time, what was happening in the Food Safety Modernization Act is they were reacting to those types of outbreaks and planning to impose the same regulations on the Salinas Valley, you know, mass lettuce producers and the farmer's market vendor. That doesn't make sense. It's not good for the consumer. It's certainly not good for the farmer. We knew they were going to be expensive um, when the regs ultimately came out. FDA's estimate was that it would cost $25,000 a year for a small farmer to comply. So we worked and got um, the tester amendment to the Food Safety Modernization Act, which exempts out small-scale direct marketing producers. Mm -hmm. So those are the sorts of things we, we've been working on. We're also now looking ahead. So... Uh, you know, those two examples are keep, let's keep bad, expensive regulations from being imposed on small producers. Mm -hmm. We also do need to shift the system because right now the system supports, you know, I think all of our, you know, all of your listeners probably have had the experience. They go to extension service and they ask for some advice or thoughts on like how to grow X in their area. And what they get is Monsanto, DuPont, Syngenta advice. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the expensive inputs to buy, the GMO seeds, the fertilizing, you know, and, and herbiciding schedule. Mm -hmm. You ask for help on 
regenerative ag, how to do rotational grazing well in your area, um, well-adapted non-GMO seeds for your area, they don't have anything. Mm -hmm. So we need to start moving the needle and getting recognition in the government agencies, our educational institutes that are supposed to be supporting farmers so that they support our farmers and provide that information and, and, and access as well. So we're starting to work on those types of initiatives. So when regulations like this impact small farmers negatively, is this by design? Is this just because regulators aren't thinking about these sort of ramifications? Or is it both? I think it's, it's both and more. So fundamentally, I think it is about large businesses who want the laws and regulations to work for them. The regulations are designed to look at processes rather than end results, because if you look at the end result of what comes out of the conventional system, it's all pretty bad, right? But if they can keep everybody's attention on the process, you can always make your process look good. So we see this particularly in meat industry, the hazard analysis and critical control point plants. They don't actually necessarily lead to a safe product at the end, but you know, you get enough lawyers and expert consultants working on your HACCP, and you can make it you know, dance and throw sparks up into the air and look really pretty. Um, the NACE issue, electronic ID, they wanted it for their export markets. They don't mind if it kills small farmers. They're not doing it to drive out small farmers. Very, very, very rarely have I ever run into something that I think is truly aimed at we want to drive small farmers out. Um, but they don't mind if it does. Now, actually, I say that. I say that from the corporate standpoint. Let's remember that the USDA policy starting in the 70s was get big or get out. Right, Earl Butts. They were meant to drive out small farmers. Um, and, and Sonny Purdue recently Lisa. said something very, very similar to that. Yes. The, the big will get bigger and the small will go out. Yeah. Something like so, that. So I do think um, that the government actually, there, there, there's, that doesn't mean, the government's a big, mom, a, a big behemoth industry. Right. Um, there are people within the government who want to support small farmers. Mm -hmm. um, and I've met them and I've talked with them and there are many I haven't met. But as a policy, yeah, there was a policy for decades, get big or get out. And that doesn't just disappear. So you have industry looking out for their own interests. You have government who thinks that efficiency is the end all be all. And then you have the health departments, which is a whole nother paradigm or a whole other interest group, because they're working on a paradigm of a reductionist sterilization philosophy. The people who head up health departments, state health departments, FDA, local health departments, learned in school, in their master's of public health, um, basically, you know, protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Micronutrients? What, what micronutrients, huh? Mm -hmm. There's, there, what do you know about this? Um, you know, the, the human health version of NPK. And they also learned that pasteurization and sterilization were the great lifesavers and antibiotics. And so we come in as a movement and we're like, oh, you've got it all wrong. It's about the micronutrients. It's about the microbiome. Please stop washing your produce. We want some dirt in our mouths. Right. And they genuinely, they think we're going to kill people. I mean, they, they, they're genuinely afraid. They aren't bad people in these health departments for the most part. Sometimes they are, you know, some mm -hmm. people. But many of them are just truly convinced we're about to, like, kill off all of the kids. And it's based on fear. I mean, I know that, you know, when I lived back in Texas, and by the way, um, Judith and I both grew up in Dallas, I, I went to a, a raw milk dairy. And it's almost like this hush-hush thing. You don't want to tell anyone about it. Oh, no. um, and I gave it to my kids. And and they, oh, they never be got very sick. quiet on that. <laughs> they never got sick. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's. I think the system is fear based in a lot of ways, um, and and that's how that's sort of what creates these sort of burdensome regulations that can, to some extent, not make sense for for most people or most producers. Well, and you know that's so. I was speaking to a group of health department folks, um, inspectors, the other a few weeks ago about cottage foods bill. You know, the, we got an expanded cottage foods bill passed in Texas, which allows more types of foods to be made in home kitchens and sold directly to consumers. 
there are different versions of this all over the country. And in Texas, ours is really a complete deregulation one where if you fall within that category, we explicitly deprive the health department of all jurisdiction. No inspections, no nothing. And I mean, one of the, uh, several of the folks in that room were really upset about this and were challenging me. And some of them were genuinely scared about like people getting sick from it. But there was also a few of them sort of going to your point, or, or another point is they, um, they don't want to get blamed when something happens. And so it's easier to sort of shut stuff down than to take any risk. Mm-hmm. Not that I think, I mean, the cottage food stuff is low risk. I mean, that's the whole point is we're looking at low risk foods. Mm-hmm. But to them, there's a risk. You know, there's a danger. And they're going, I mean, literally, I have had them say, like, we're going to be the ones yelled at when the, you know, if there's an outbreak and people get sick, people be yelling at us, why didn't we do something? And so they feel like they have to do something to prevent getting yelled at. And it's like, right. okay, I even can sympathize with that, but that's not a good enough reason to tell my farmers that they can't make fermented pickles and sell them to people that they want, that, who want to buy them. Yeah. Like, I, I sympathize. I hear you. Tough luck. <laughs> Well, you know, I want to hear more about um, the work that FARFA does and, 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 and the farmers and producers that, that you're working with. And, and I also want to know why you think small farmers matter. Because I think that's the sort of uh, implicit Im- assumption yeah, that is. we're making here it is absolutely. that small farmers matter. But why is that in, in this age of get big or get out or we have to feed the world? Why are small farmers more important than ever? Because, I mean, the, the hard reason, the reason I pause when you ask that is it's almost like, which reason do I go to? Because <laughs> there's so many reasons. So I'll pick on one that, you know, that triggers off of one of the specific things you just said. How do we feed the world? We feed the world with small farmers. We have, we've, we have at this point practical experience and, by the way, lots of research and, and publications that tell us that the idea of feeding the world through mass-scale industrial agriculture fails. The best way to feed people is for their communities to be able to raise food sustainably. And then, I mean, I like my bananas. Yes, let's have some exports and imports. But a community needs to be able to feed itself. And by the way, really, when we're talking about third world countries and people who literally suffer famine, it's also about democracy and, and, and getting rid of corruption and such. I mean, it's not about how much food you produce. You know, in taking that here... I, I'm a pragmatist. I, I like seeing what works. And I came into agriculture from a sustainability perspective. I was an environmentalist. And I fell in love. Acres, I started reading Acres 20 years ago. And I got turned on to it by Dr. Dick Richardson saying, mm-hmm. if you care about the environment, you should care about where your food comes from. Yeah. And I just read Acres, and it was this world-changing moment for me. Because what I saw was we can do this farming that heals the soil, that is humane for animals, that is good for local rural communities and rural economies. It's like this amazing game changer. And so far, I've yet to see it work on an industrial scale. Now, when we say small scale, small scale doesn't necessarily mean just one acre. It might. I have lots of members who are one acre farms. Mm -hmm. I also have farms that are a few hundred acres or even a thousand acres or more. I mean, small encompasses a fairly wide range of small. Um, It's not tens of thousands of acres. It's not one company controlling 20% of the market share. Right. What we have seen in practical terms is this type of agriculture works best on what I'd actually say is family scale, human scale, right? even more than small scale, on, on the people scale. Because when it grows too big, first of all, you need eyes on the acreage. Mm-hmm. To do this type of farming, you need to know your land. Mm-hmm. You need eyes on the acres. Right. Um, you can't do it remotely by electronic sensors from an office somewhere. And it's hard to keep up the ethic that really puts this holistic picture, mm-hmm. all of the benefits together, when it gets too big. Right. And it also, due to its inherent limitations, creates a, a shorter supply chain. Yes. Which is important. I mean, there's there's not much distance between the farmer and the people, small farmers and the people who are actually 
eating what they produce. And that, again, keeps this holistic thing. So, you know, the other thing is looking at the economics of it. Small farms matter because, again, and what we saw, we saw when small farmers, when rural, when, when farmers thrive, the rural communities thrive. And what we have seen with the destruction of the farmers has been the destruction of the entire community around them. And you see this, you know, you come to my, you know, small town in, in Texas, and you see falling down, how beautiful houses falling down. You see downtown literally crumbling. I mean, literally building yeah. good quality buildings that used to be part of a thriving Main Street, Main Street dying. Right. Yeah, I mean, this uh, seems to come up in almost every interview that I do uh, that, you know, these rural areas are also becoming, you know, food deserts. You cannot actually find food there. Um, I think the uninitiated, people who are just driving through, look at those areas and they see the breadbasket. They see a place where wheat's being grown, where cotton's being grown, where soy and corn are being grown. They don't understand that in many cases that those crops are not going to humans. They're going to maybe livestock. They're going to ethanol. Um, and they don't probably understand that those those areas are sort of toxic waste sites. I mean, that's... that's and, yeah. and, but, and they don't understand that the people who live in those communities uh, can't get organic produce, for example. No. They, they, they don't have access to it. Generally, they don't have the income to afford it. Um, they suffer the worst from the chemicals that are used. I mean, what's really heartbreaking is, um, you know, we think, I think a lot of speakers and acres have touched on the dangers of glyphosate, you know, and, and how dangerous that is. Um, and there are other pesticides and herbicides that are used that are also very damaging to, to human health. Well, you know, you have all these lovely studies, and I don't want to minimize, they're great, you know, where you take some family and the family eats organic for a week or two weeks and they test the urine and all of a sudden they're clear of pesticides. And that's awesome. But those are actually urban families they're testing. Mm -hmm. When they've done, I've, what I've seen is when you've done, when you do similar tests in rural communities and rural families, the level of pesticides and herbicides go down in the urine when they mm -hmm. switch to all organic. But they don't disappear because it's everywhere. The air the we're air. breathing, the mm -hmm. water that falls, the rainwater, you know, we do rainwater collection for our water. But I know the water that we collect has glyphosate in it mm -hmm. because of where we live. Right. So, so it's really disheartening. Here we are, organic farmers, um, eating all organic. You know, we make the effort. We buy from local farmers as much as we can. We buy organic almost entirely, local and some grocery. And I don't want to do that test. I don't want to know how much we still have exposure just because we're living in a farming community. Your organization has had a long list of successes, and I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk more about that because I feel like um, – there, there is hope, and 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 I, I feel like yes. your organization is is a beacon of that of that hope. So, please, yeah, please talk about some of the things you've been able to accomplish for small farmers over the last several years. So, I'll, I'll touch on the very first two that I mentioned, but I just want to sort of focus on the success portion. You know, back in two thousand and six, when USDA put out the documents for the National Animal ID System, we were their documents set out a plan step by step that by January two thousand nine. Every single livestock and poultry animal in this country, right down to backyard chickens, was going to have a 14-digit internationally unique number and be in their database mm -hmm. and every movement tracked. Mm -hmm. And Texas was one of the first states to start moving forward on implementation. Mm -hmm. And we reached out for help and said, who's working on this? Somebody. You've got to tell me you're trying to stop this. And we got responses that basically boiled down to either they didn't know what we were talking about because they hadn't been paying attention or they thought it was a done deal. And I really, I got told by several groups, allies, learn to live with it. And I looked at it and I said, we won't. There'll be a few farm, there'll be too many farmers who cannot learn to live with it. They will be out of business. The damage to sustainable livestock will be, you know, irrit un, uh, you know, permanent. You know, we won't be able to fix this. Um, and we stopped it. Mm -hmm. Everyone told us it couldn't be stopped. And in 2010, Secretary Vilsack withdrew the program. You know, when we started on the tester amendment to FISMA, again, even some allies were like, that's too radical. You can't ask for an exemption. You just have to ask for them to play nice with us, basically. And I said, mm -hmm. we know they won't play nice. What's the point of doing that? We have to, we have to protect our farmers. 
And we got, in both of those movements, we got such an amazing diversity, left wing, right wing, off the charts, wherever you want to put it on the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk about our type of farming and what we're trying to do, you can have benefits. It doesn't matter what someone's political philosophy is. There are benefits to this. And when we can stay focused on that, we bring together these really diverse coalitions. Um, and so, you know, we got that amendment in. Um, we got, you know, we're, we're trying some more subtle things. In Texas, we got a bill passed this, this last session, just this year, that requires the health department to respond to questions from farmers asking what do they need to do to be in compliance with the law. Mm -hmm. The health department has to respond within 30 days. And if you comply with what they tell you, the inspector can't come out and fine you. And you had a very personal Which, experience with this. Um, you you were trying to get answers. And, and they didn't tell us. <laughs> right. I got, I got told we were trying to find out, did we need to do a certain type of water testing for the t exact type of thing we were doing? We were storing frozen meat on our farm. Mm -hmm. I just needed to know, did this reg apply to us? And the response from the health department was, that's for you to decide. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's nice. And if your inspector disagrees with my decision, you know, he can find me. And I'm an attorney. I used to work at one of the largest law firms in the country. Um, you know, people used to pay, you know, 350, 400 bucks an hour for me to give them legal advice. Mm -hmm. And there are times I have trouble figuring out what these regs require. I mean, they're not written for our type of producer. So you, you combine these regs that aren't written for us, people who aren't lawyers, just trying to do what's legal, and health departments that basically play hide the ball and gotcha. Yeah. Um, but the, the reason I think this is really groundbreaking is actually that, to some extent, that happens in almost every industry now. Yeah. You talk to almost any small business in any industry, and they'll tell you something of that story. Hmm. You know, maybe not as difficult as small farms have it, but something. We're the only, as far as I know, we're the only industry now in Texas, small farms have this ability to require the government to say what the law is when it applies to my operation and hold them to that. Right. So that's something, you know, I'd love to take that and work it as a model bill all over the country because it's the way things should be. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to comply with the law and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to do the, I won't say the right thing, but the legal thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, let's divorce morality from it. You're trying to do the legal thing. It shouldn't be hard to do that. Yeah. It shouldn't be difficult to know what you need to do. Yeah. So... You know, working on things like that. So we got, we actually got five bills through this session. That was one of them. Mm -hmm. We got an expanded cottage foods bill through. We got a bill to cap permit fees so that farmers can come, and other food vendors can come to the farmer's markets more affordably and stop being used basically as a cash cow, which is yeah. how the local health departments were using them. So these are, you know, these are the sorts of bills. The way we set our priorities is we talk to our farmers and we ask, what is it you need? That, that needs to get changed to help you stay in business and be able to keep providing good food to people. Well, I'm kind of interested in hearing more about, about you and your connection to the food system. Um, you didn't grow up on a farm, did you? I mean, I think you grew up in Dallas, just like me. You were a, a city kid. I grew up in North Dallas, the daughter of two university professors. Uh, <laughs> I was about as far removed from the farm as it gets. Yeah. Um, but I grew well, so up... So what was that evolution? I mean, how did, how did you end up where you are now? I, I grew up loving land. I grew up mm -hmm. loving connection with nature. And so I became an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. And I still consider myself an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. And I went into environmental law. I went to law school. I did an undergraduate in biology, went to law school, went to environmental law. I was very frustrated because it was all about how do we work within this man-made artificial system to reduce damage to the environment. And it's important. I mean, like, I am very grateful for the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. But it's really not very satisfying. Um, and I felt like there were all these possible solutions, but as a lawyer, that wasn't my role to come up with those. It was, here's the law, you know, let's stay within it. So I decided to go back and get an advanced degree and start working on all these creative science-oriented solutions. And I met Dr. Dick Richardson at UT, who was um, active with Holistic Management International. And like I said, I said earlier, he, he looked at me and said, if you care about food, or if you care about the environment, you should care about where your food comes from. And in 99, this local food ag wasn't really on the popular radar. But he literally, a Acres was my start. He had me read Acres, subscribe to Acres. Um, he had me read Alan Savory's book. Mm -hmm. And 
things just changed. I mean, I finally saw something where it wasn't a trade-off. It wasn't, well, we can help the environment if we give up this stuff for people, or but if it's good for people, then it's not so good for the animals. You know, all of these zero-sum games that we yeah. have, that we're taught, and it's like, oh, wait, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. So I started studying this. I was going to go actually be a consultant. I studied with Dr. Elaine Ingham. I was going to go do soul food web advising um, Mm -hmm. and and work with farmers on transitioning to organic and and improving their operations. Um, And that was my plan. I was working towards Mm -hmm. that. And then this national animal ID system issue came up. Yeah. And I was, they were pushing it in Texas. And... um, I was a lawyer. I knew how to deal with administrative agencies. There was no one else stepping up. Yeah. You know, there was no one else. So I actually, I didn't know what I was getting into. I told my law firm, my law firm asked me, I, I went up and I told my law firm I was quitting. And they said, please don't quit. We like you. Right. <laughs> um, and my, and my, the senior partner looked at me and goes, um, how long do you think it'll take you to, to deal with this? Yeah. And I was like, oh, there's a special session coming up in the Texas Ledge, six months. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I had no idea right. what was involved in fighting big ag or changing the laws. Um, three years later, my law firm called and said, if you're not coming back, could you please empty out your office so we could have the space back? That's how immersed you were. That's, you just, I, just, I, I went into this. I, I, <laughs> right. Um, and I, and I, just, I found this is my community. This is, I, you know, we farm. My husband and I have a sustainable livestock farm, and we also do small orchard. This is my community. It's what I want for my child. It's what I want for our whole future. And we can't just think that we can farm and it's going to happen. And that's not underestimating. God, I know how hardworking farm is. You know, it's it's insane how hard it is just to farm. (laughs) But that's not enough. We right. have to be at the table on the policy work. We have to be there working to change the economic and regulatory system or we don't have a future for this type of farming. But at a certain point, you were doing all this activist work and you made a decision that I can't just be an activist. I have to be a farmer too. Um, what, actu- what was that like? So actually, we were already, it, it actually was, we were already doing some farming. So what okay. happened was okay. while I was still, while I was doing the studying to go be a consultant, mm-hmm. my husband retired from the Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. And so we set up a small farm. And so we actually were, when the NACE issue came up, we were doing some pastured poultry, okay. a few pastured lambs, very, very small scale. But yeah, we were already farming. Um, and like I said, that was already, so that was the thing, it was already very human to me. It wasn't just theoretical. It wasn't just, oh, here's this nice idea of sustainable farming. So those two things were I developing. I knew what this was. Together. Yeah. Yeah. So what's that, what has that been like, balancing that life of activism <laughs> and, and, you know, like uh, feeding your chickens? So my husband does by far the vast majority of the daily work on the farm. I mean, that's, I, I, I work on Farfa. You know, yeah. he works on the farm. He sometimes helps with Farfa. I do a lot of the farm planning. Yeah. Like I do sort of our long-term planning. I figure out which fruit trees, like I did, I did the planning for like what fruit trees we're planting and which varieties, you know, yeah. what animals sick. I'm the, I'm the medicine person in our family. I do right. the homeopathy. Right. But day to day, you know, he, do, he does the farming and, and I do the activism. So you really have like a kind of not just a, a theoretical affinity for, for small farmers. You are one and so you get it and you get the struggles that, that they face every day. I mean... We, um, we sell at the farmer's market. I mean, we, yeah. we, we, we know what it means waking up at 4 a.m. To, to go drive down to the farmer's market and stand at that booth. Um, yeah. We know what it means when people have an issue with the pricing because they are just so used to the conventional crap prices that even though mm. they're coming to the farmer's market looking for something better, they're still like, this is what it costs. It's like, this is the real cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, this, this, is, this is where we live, literally. Yeah. Are, are health inspectors terrified of you? This this farmer lawyer <laughs> like hybrid? I don't know if terrified is the right word. I certainly they definitely don't like me very much. They don't mess with you. Yeah. Well, what else do you want to do? You want to add to that? I mean, I, I, I definitely want to highlight as many accomplishments that, that Farfa has under its belt um, as possible. Um, but I'm also hear, interested in hearing sort of about the composition of the group. It's a national organization, a broad coalition of people. Tell me. How diverse is it really? Like, I mean, give me some examples of that. 
so, it you know, we've got, it's both diverse and not diverse. So in some ways, I, I'll say, like, so the, the lack of diversity is it's pr relatively small producers, you know, again, almost all sustainable, all, you know, using organic methods. Not some certified organic, most not. Mm -hmm. um, but the diversity comes in of, you know, we've got people who have a quarter acre, you know, intensive specialty crop to people who run large, you know, in our terms, you know, large cattle operations, mm -hmm. grass-fed beef operations. Um, we have, you know, I, I think that every type of production, food production there is, you know, mm -hmm. we've got people doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got people also at the different stages. So we are, our policies, our, our um, priorities are set by our farmers. When, I, when, when we look at what are we working on, we go back to the farmers and ranchers. But our membership is also, you know, small-scale artisan producers, people, you know, it's chefs, it's restaurants, it's consumers. Um, it's the whole community that's involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's vitally important. Again, I, I, I do keep coming back to community about this mm -hmm. um, because fundamentally that is our strength. Um, and one of the things that we do that I'm really proud of um, that feeds into, again, who's involved with us is teaching people how to be effective advocates. I don't want, I, I don't think it's possible and I don't want for it to be, oh, okay, I pay my membership dues and Judith takes care of it. <laughs> like, problem solved, you know. Mm -hmm. First of all, it can't work because we don't have enough money to like compete just on a money basis, you know. Um, and it, what we have to have is people. And this is true both in agriculture and beyond. People need to understand what it takes to be effective advocates for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and very early on, right when I formed Farfa, before we knew what the hell I was getting into, you know, when I had no clue, right. I, I was really lucky, um, and I got to go hear Richard Harwood speak. He, mm -hmm. he had a, he has an institute for civic involvement, and it is devoted to getting people engaged. And I remember very vividly him talking about the fact that. Um, we can't expect people to engage if they don't have hope. And this was before, you know, pre-Obama, you know, let's, you know. He was like, you know, everyone has their families, their friends, their hobbies, their work, whatever it is. They've got other things to do with their time. Why would you get involved if you didn't think it, it makes a difference? You have to have hope. He goes, and the reason pe not very many people have hope anymore Partly, and what we point to a lot are the politicians. They break their word. They're bought out, blah, blah, blah. He goes, but the nonprofits have played just as much of a role because they keep telling people, look at all the auto email messages. And it's gotten worse since then. This was you know, 15 years ago. You know, click here, sign the petition. Mm -hmm. That makes a difference. Your voice matters. Mm -hmm. um, if we get this bill passed, it's solved. Oh, my God, we have to kill this and it, you know, or the world ends. And people get involved and they sign the online petition or do the auto email. And that bill passes or that bill fails. And the world didn't change. Mm -hmm. So what was the point? Mm -hmm. And the nonprofits do that because it's the easiest way to get people engaged. It's the easiest way to fundraise. And God knows I have sympathy for that because if we don't have enough money to pay people, then our doors close. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's a reason. But... It perpetuates this sort of non-engagement by people. And so what FARFA has done, we, we don't send out those systems. And I get fetched out all the time. Why do you make it so hard? Why don't you just let us punch a button? Because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do constantly is teach people what it takes to be involved. And they can take that and apply that in any area of their lives. You know, you want to go be an activist on whatever cause. You have any issue you care about. Yeah. This is how you do it. And that plus, so, so there's the in really engaging and also teaching people to think about how to message it. So what I was saying earlier about the advantage and the strength we have is that we can appeal to people from anywhere on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I think that's particularly true in sustainable ag. I mean, we have so much going for us. Mm -hmm. But it's somewhat true in almost any area. If you, if you try, you can find a way to connect with people who come from a different perspective than you do. But you have to try, and you have to think about why that's important, that there's value in making that effort. 
And that's what we have to do to make change. So we teach activism workshops. I teach, you know, how to do this. We do a little bit of it almost each email. We sort of teach people in our action alerts, like, right. here's some ideas. Think about this. Um, and that's slow. And another thing Richard Harwood said is, you know, if you're going to be honest with people, you don't say we're going to be able to change something, you know, this year. You're going to say it took us 40 years to get to this point. It's going to take us, you know, 10 or 20 years of hard work to get out, of, you know, to change it. Right. I mean, it's it's cross-generational. It's, it's doing work that may not pay off in the next 10 years or next 20 years. That's, that's hard to look that far in, into the future. So when you look into the future, what do you see? So uh, first I'll say, so you have to balance it. You have to do some stuff that will make a difference now. Mm-hmm. Let's get those permit fees dealt with now so that my farmers don't spend as much on permit fees to go to farmer's market. Right. We have to do things that have this impact now. But yes, we have to do things that are laying this groundwork for the next decade. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... I think we could go either way when I look into the future. I mean, honestly, you, you look at how consolidated the industry is, how much power is in the hands of just a few corporations. Mm-hmm. And it's not just economic power, but political power that comes with it. So there is a very real dystopian future <laughs> that that's out there. But there also is just the last 12 months, I'm amazed by like mainstream media coverage of how regenerative agriculture could capture carbon dioxide and affect right. climate change. Um, the knowledge about the microbiome, like, oh my God, people are finally starting to figure out that not all bacteria are bad. Right. You know, there's, there's, there is this, we're hitting a critical mass mm-hmm. where if we really engage, now the problem is that could still get turned to the benefit of the large corporations. You know, mm-hmm. they can co-opt those ideas yeah. all too easily. We right. can't just trust, oh, look, critical consciousness is happening. Isn't this wonderful? We have to get in there, use that fact that more people are understanding these issues and guide it to a future which is you know, decentralized, which is community-centered again, which is you know, small farmers in rural communities making a fair living, raising healthy food in a way that their farms are in good condition to pass on, whether it's to their kids or someone else from the next generation. Right. Um, that, that's a future that's realistic, mm-hmm. but we're going to have to get in there and, and fight for it. Judith, thanks so much for talking to me. My pleasure. Thank you. There you have it. Thanks to Sherry and Judith for joining us, and thank you for listening to another episode of Tractor Time, brought to you by Acres USA and BCS America. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere podcasts are available. Also find us on acresusa.com, ecofarmingdaily.com, and don't forget to subscribe to our monthly magazine. I also want to put a new event on your radar. We're putting on our first ever Advancing Industrial Hemp event in Greeley, Colorado on May 18th and 19th. It'll feature a host of hemp experts, including Doug Fine. He's written a few books on hemp, and he's a past guest on this podcast, so if you missed that episode, go back and give it a listen. Like all Acres events, Advancing Industrial Hemp is focused on giving farmers the information they need to run financially successful operations that nourish the soil in the process. If you're interested in hemp and who isn't, check out the event page at acresusa.com. Thanks for listening and have a great week.